Welcome to the architectural series, Architects Talk, or Conversations with Architects. Uh, today we have a very distinguished guest, uh, Mr. King Young, mm -hmm. and welcome to Turkey, welcome to our series. I think it's not the first time uh, that you are in Turkey, so you are quite familiar with Turkey and Istanbul. Yes, well, thank you, Abdi. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and. Uh, in one of your websites, I have, uh, I'm quoting now, you are saying, I'm an ecologist first, an architect second. Uh, why do you call yourself be being an ecologist before being an architect? Well, when I wrote my PhD, mm -hmm. I had to study ecology. Mm -hmm. And so in that, after doing that, I joined the British Ecological Society, so I became an ecologist. Um, but at the end of the day... So um, it's a real title. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, there are many societies. This is just one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many ecological societies. This is just one of them. Um, but I think the environment is much more... There are two types of environment. There's the built environment, which is architecture, and there's the natural environment, which is ecology. I think the natural environment has to take precedent over the built environment. And that's what you are trying to do, as far as I know. I mean, you are trying to... Uh, integrate these two different environments in one. Yes. Uh, and you call it ecological architecture. Yes, ecological Eco ecological design. Yes. Ecological, ecological design. So, yes. can you just open up a little bit? What uh, What do you mean by ecological design? Ecological design is different from conventional design, with only one difference: the environment becomes one of the considerations in design. Mm -hmm. And the environment is not just climate, but includes everything that is natural. And ecology is defined as the study of organisms in the environment. And in the environment, there are a multitude of organisms. There are flora and fauna. And within the, uh, uh, within, within the biosphere, there are units in nature called ecosystems. And ecosystems consist of communities of plants and animals acting together to form a whole. And that's the environment for me. But as far as, I mean, we all know, uh, since Vitruvius, architecture has always been sensitive to uh, ecology and nature and, uh, let's say, uh, what, what comes with nature. So being friendly with nature or having a, such a continuity with nature has had always been an issue for good architecture, at least, or for, for timeless way of building. So were there a rupture or some, something changed in the, in, in the way that, I mean, we are recalling ecological architecture? No, no, no. Not every architect designs with nature. A lot of architects just forget about nature. They just go a piece of land and clear the land and build whatever they want. But that's not recognizing nature. That's not even Vitruvius. And so we have to start by looking at the location where we're designing. Mm -hmm. Location has its own climate. And so we need to design, first of all, what are called biochromatic buildings, buildings that respond to the climate and make use of the ambient energy of location, and that you should be a low energy structure before you put any electrical and technological systems in. Then using that as an armature, as a, as a scaffold, then everything else we do uh, is to enhance this ecological impact. But not all sites are the same. A lot of architects think that you know, this piece of land here, piece of land there, every site is different. Now, if you build in a city, that's fine because in a city, the land has been cleared, the topsoil is gone. You, can, you don't really need to think too much about ecology except the climate effects of your building on the climate, the effects of your building on surrounding buildings. But if you're building in the countryside, every part of the earth is different. So you have to look at the soil because soil is a very valuable resource. If you scrape the soil and throw it away, mm -hmm. then you lost the valuable resource because soils of microbes have, have nutrients you know, which enable plants to grow. And so whenever we design outside the city, we have to understand the ecology of the land before we put anything upon it. Now tell me how many architects do that? Very few. I think what you are uh, mentioning is a sense of contextuality. It, that's, it is only some, one, some... That, that's only one aspect of ecological architecture. Yeah, that's the multitude it, of other aspects. It's inevitable, I mean, in, in good architecture at least. Uh, but however, I mean, there is the issue of planning. Uh, be, before coming to the architectural scale, 
many things are set uh, up uh, within the city scale. So, I mean, there is a very little room for the architect to operate. I mean, once all the givens of the building are known, the density, the orientation, the, I mean, concentration, whatever it is, it, it becomes very difficult to move. I so, don't think so. Mm -hmm. Because uh, not all cities are planned the same. Mm -hmm. Not all cities have the same planning constraints. A lot of architects think that all I do is put plants on balconies. Mm -hmm. That's what you said earlier on. Yeah. But we don't just do that. A lot of, I have a lot of imitators. They think they just put plants in buildings and that's good enough. We try and design our buildings as what I call constructed ecosystems. In our buildings, we create habitats within it. Mm -hmm. Habitats are particular locations, areas where different species live. We do research on the fauna that we want to bring back into that site. Because the city has been previously, before the built city, it used to be a forest, it used to be a, a, a natural land. Human beings go on cities and just scrape the land and convert it into something which is totally denatured. So what I try to do is to bring diversity back into the city. But I have different approaches for different sites. For the city, I have one approach. For the suburban area, another approach. For the pristine uh, countryside, I have another approach. And so within the city, what we try to do is that to bring, enhance the biodiversity and design our building and our development as an ecosystem. In other words, we try to create habitats within our buildings, and the habitats could be green walls, could be green roofs, could be green atriums, could be green patches on the ground, could be constructed wetland, could be bioswales. And so with these habitats, we try and select the native fauna that we want to bring back. We should not, make them sustainable yes. in, in their own Having climate. identified mm. a, a, a native fauna, we want to bring them back for three reasons. For refuge, for feeding, for breeding. Mm -hmm. And then, in order to attract the fauna into the uh, habitats, we choose the flora mm -hmm. to attract the fauna. So we're, we, having identified the native flora that will attract the native fauna, then we create landscape conditions within our buildings, within those habitats, and enable you know, these species to survive over the four seasons of the year. So in this way, our buildings are not just denatured structures where you just plonk you know, vegetation or flowers or, you know, onto the building, but we create habitats so the whole the building itself becomes an so ecosystem. It, it's how it differentiates from its imitators or uh, some of the examples that... that I well, mean, well, it's not so much differentiation, but I'm, I'm saying that this is the next generation next of green generation building. Next generation building. Rough green uh, buildings, uh, rough yes. building. Yeah. But it is not only a biological and physical issue, but it's also a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how do people cope with it? I mean, how, what do you observe when you look at the yes. finished buildings and the inhabitants of the buildings? I mean, okay. are they are they a volunteer uh, for a kind of mm -hmm. a sustainable, uh, let's say, fauna in their buildings? Yes. Well, it depends on the age groups and, and depends on who, who the people are living there. Mm -hmm. And they're not always uh, residents. They could be even the office dwellers, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But what we try to do is to make our buildings into healthy buildings. Mm -hmm. For instance, vegetation absorbs carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and gives us oxygen. Mm -hmm. So most buildings with plants have a much more healthy microclimate on the, around the building. And so for office workers, you know, they feel healthier. Mm -hmm. When they feel healthier, there's less absenteeism. And studies have shown that when people, you know, they call it biophilia. Biophilia is a, is, is a, it's a study where they found that patients in hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, those who face brickwork against those who face vegetation, those who face vegetation heal faster. And so vegetation has an uh, enormous impact on the well, well-being of human beings. So these are just for office workers and factory workers. But for residents, a lot of young people like to live in green buildings because they feel ethically responsible that this is the way they should go. And studies have shown the buildings which are green, and they're not green because I put vegetations in them, they're, you know, they're green because they save energy and save water, appreciates much, much faster and higher than non-green buildings. Now, yeah. let's, say, let's say you're a developer, you're a purchaser, investor. Mm -hmm. You have two buildings mm -hmm. to choose from. So buy building A, building B. Building A is the non-green building. It's a high-energy building. It wastes energy, it wastes water. 
Building B saves energy, saves water, and is also healthier. You find that you prefer building B because, you know, it, uh, first of all, you have, because it saves energy and water, there's less service charge to its, uh, mm -hmm. to its uh, tenants and uh, to its uh, occupants. And so it appreciates much faster. And studies have shown to show that green buildings appreciate faster. But as you mentioned, green building does not necessarily or limited with the vegetation and the flora. It, yes. it has to have some other characteristics yes. uh, as far as I understand. Right. And, uh, and uh, including, of course, energy sensitivity, yes. sensitivity environmental sen sensitivity, uh, contextual yes. uh, at the beginning sensitivity, etc. So, uh, Let me just explain that a little bit. Yeah, please. What we try to do is to design buildings as what we call NZEB, mm -hmm. net zero energy buildings or carbon neutral buildings. Mm -hmm. So that we go through a series of steps mm -hmm. from passive mode design, we start by designing a building to be passive, low energy, then we mix it mixed mode where there's some mechanical systems, and then we use the most efficient in mechanical, uh, full mode systems we can have. Then mm -hmm. finally we use productive mode where we try to use renewable sources of energy. So we head towards an increasing situation of less dependent on energy from the grid. And so in this way, we design what we call net zero energy buildings. At the same time, when we design buildings, we try and close the water cycle. Mm -hmm. That means you know, the, the gray water is recycled and reused. The black water is treated, not by mechanical means, but through what are called constructed wetland. Natural, yeah. Because, yeah, natural means. That means we have a series of polishing ponds, mm -hmm. so that by the time the, the black water goes down to the last pond, it's almost potable, it's almost drinkable. And then not only that, we look at energy, look at materials, we look at, we look at some water, and we look at materials, so we try and design, use materials which are recyclable, materials which are not particularly from, from, from long distance away, mm -hmm. so you have energy cost of transport, and try and be, design buildings so that materials could be reused and recyclable uh, in, in, in every way, and so that, that at, the end of, at the end of the useful life of the building, materials don't just go into the um, landfill, but they could be restocked and reused again. So there are many aspects of green design. Do you also use some uh, clean energy systems like solar panels or wind energy or something? Yeah, that's what I meant. You know, the last stage in, in net zero energy design is what I call productive mode. Productive mode means you produce your own energy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That means you either use solar energy or use wind energy or use ground source heat pumps or depending on location, we can use, even use tidal energy or use wind energy. But wind energy is very difficult because not in the cities. Because for wind energy to work, you need at least a consistent uh, uh, yeah, that's wind true. speed of at least five meters per second. Mm -hmm. And very few cities can you know, get a consistent speed. But out in the countryside, it's much easier. That's true, yes. And also, I mean, the, 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 I think the unique problem is, uh, of course, there are contributions on building scale. But most of these issues has to be uh, must have a wide range coverage in mm -hmm. terms of the urban scale and the city scale. Yes. Isn't it easier to uh, design in urban scale yeah. so that, I mean, many buildings can share the same, same yeah. system, it may be more economical, culturally it will be more uh, legitimate, etc., etc. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, are there any trials like that? Oh, uh, no, that's exactly what I'm on about. Mm -hmm. Because how many green buildings can you do? If you look that's, at all the green buildings the case, in the world, yes. it makes the minimal difference. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a true ecological designer, you have to design at a city scale or at what I call the level of the infrastructure. And you tried something in Turkey, in Istanbul, in the competition, as far as I know, in uh, yes. uh, the yes. uh, area, isn't it so? Yes. What happened to that project? Well, I don't know, because uh, I came and saw the... Uh, I think the, the governor or somebody in charge of the district, and he said, he just nodded and he, you know, he took my brochure, then that's the end of it. But as I understand, it was, the site is between two constituencies, yeah, is, yeah. and both the two constituencies don't particularly sort of, are able to come together. But what I tried to do, as I mentioned earlier on, is to design infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So all my great master plans start with four infrastructures. First one is what I call the green infrastructure. That means green infrastructure, is, which is nature's utilities. Nature has, you know, has utilities. Nature gives fresh air, gives, creates fresh water. You know, if we remove nature, 
then we become very dependent on, on uh, you know, on mechanical utilities. So like most cities, you know, you've totally been denatured. So when we design a master plan, we'll start with the green eco-infrastructure. Then we try and create a water infrastructure, make it close to water loop as much as possible, and have what we call sustainable drainage. Mm -hmm. You see, in a, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in nature, the water, the rainwater, the falls on the land, filters through, goes through the soil, and goes back to recharge the groundwater. Mm -hmm. Now what happens now in our city is that rain falls on the ground, goes into the roads, into pervious surfaces, goes into drains. Once it gets to a drain, it's gone forever. Yeah, it goes into the true, sea. Yeah. So then the water, the, the, you know, the groundwater gets depleted. And so we try and design uh, sustainable drainage. And, we try, and with water design, we try and close the loop as much as possible. So that's the second infrastructure, which I call the blue infrastructure. That's true, yeah. The third is what I call the human society, because human, our activities have to change. Our diets have to change. Our, our lifestyles have to change. Right, yeah. The trouble with human society is that, you know, um, for some reason or other, society has been encouraged to buy things, to, to acquire things, to have a consumer type of attitude. We have to try and change that. We have to educate people to stop being consumerist and that make good, make use of what you have already. You don't have to have anything more than what you already you have. So for instance, you know, how many pairs of shoes do you need? You need maybe two pairs of shoes, or in case one gets wet with no <laughs> use. How many shirts do you need? You know, but well, you know, I've seen people with, you know, 50 to 100 pairs of shoes, you know, you don't need all that. You never, in a lifetime, wear all those pairs of shoes, you know. How, how do you evaluate the culture in Malaysia in that sense, I mean? Sorry? In, in your own country, I yes. mean, how do you evaluate the culture? It's, it's exactly the same. Is it the same? The, developed the, world wants, the developing world wants to imitate, the, wants, to, wants to adopt the lifestyle of mm. the developed world. Yeah. And so it's the same. It's, it's you know, a, so we have to educate people. So there's an accelerated commodification and uh, it, it is... It happens everywhere. It well, happens you know. everywhere, yeah. That's so, you know, it's not just in Turkey, you know, not just in Malaysia, but in China, in India, you know, because the, the developed world wants to be like... The developing world wants to be like the developed world. Mm -hmm. And that is the mistake we're all making. That's true, yes. And, and, and the only way to change is through education. But on the other hand, I, I feel that... Uh, this issue of ecology, green building, sustainability are all concepts which are also very open to commodification. So lots of architects imitate it and to, mm -hmm. to gain a kind of a sense of identity. They give certificates and things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, you go to a, a very big building, uh, an airport and something like that, and yeah. you see on the wall that it's a... Yeah. intelligent building or sustainable building, whatever it is, because, I mean, there are some uh, parking lots for the cycles and uh, some green terraces, etc., etc. So it's a, I think it's a reductionist approach to conceptualize the idea of sustainability and ecological building. Well, the, and the, the, it is very difficult to, difficult to uh, tackle with this issue. Mm, those are people who are giving green design a bad name. That's true, yeah. You know, because they think that certification is the end all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, some architects who say, oh, I've done, you know, uh, two dozen lead platinum buildings. Yeah, I know true. everything about green design. But actually, the trouble with at least accreditation system, the prescriptive systems. Prescriptive means these are targets you have to meet. What we want to go is change from prescriptive system to performance-based system where we try and hate towards zero energy rather than meet a target of 100 kilowatts per square meter random or whatever it is, or to try not to use more than you know, 20 liters of water per day or whatever. But we should try and recycle the water rather than limit it by prescribing the, the limits. And so while these um, certification systems are useful in, in engendering a greater interest in green design, and getting a lot of architects into green design, you know, the fault with these accreditation systems is that it engenders a certain amount of arrogance in architect. An architect thinks, oh, just because my airport's green, you know, <laughs> I've got so, you know, certified or lead platinum, uh -huh. you know, that's it, it is. But it's not enough, you have to yeah. do much more. The per prescriptive, prescriptive system is, yes. uh, I, I think, kind of oppo opposing to the contextuality, the idea of contextuality. I mean, uh, uh, the, the spe speciality of the design mm -hmm. with reference to the yes. uh, area or right. the climate or the context, okay. uh, that, that's yeah. because you are trying to uh, 
put everything in the same box, in yes. the same standards. Yes. So it's, it's, I think, yeah. it's very I want to I want to correct a, a, a misperception about green design. A lot of people think that I just do green design. But if you look at design generally and look at green design, I'm pretty well sure that within five to 10 years, every architect would do green design authentically. Inevitably. Inevitably. Yes. They do it because you know, they've been taught to do this. And that, in fact, if you go to any architect office, whether in Istanbul or whether in Europe, in France, or in UK, or in the US, every architect will say, we do green design. But whether to the extent of authenticity of doing it, you know, it's debatable. But it is good that a lot of architects want to do it. But within five to 10 years, I think that most architects will do it very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very good for the environment. Why is it good? Because then we can focus on what architecture should be really doing. Now, I think a good design must do the following things. Number one, it must work. If the design doesn't work, doesn't function well, it's, it's a waste of time and money. Second is that it must look beautiful. Now, that's, that's subjective, mm -hmm. of course. But the, that's the reason why we're architects. We want to make things as beautiful as possible. Third is that it must meet criteria. You know, this must be built within cost, must be built within time, must meet authorities' requirements, must meet planning requirements. And, and then fourth, it must be green, so they must buy and integrate with the environment. But the fifth is the most important. Culture. No. Architecture must make people happy. That, that's true, but I mean... Uh, it must make pleasure for them. The demand is very important. I mean, we want, like buying the shoes, yes. many shoes, more than we need. Yes. I mean, we like to live in large spaces, large shopping malls. And, uh, I mean, you need to, uh, you, you first decide to uh, heat and cool uh, yeah. but, but having, twice as big as needed, then you want to make economy, how, how to make it efficient. I mean, there's a logical contradiction, isn't it, no, no, so no, no, within no, no. itself? I haven't got my graphs here to show you, but I have a graph that shows developed country, developing country, and, and non-developed countries. It and will then, be very interesting. I will put it in the... On the other the, side, yeah. we have happiness. Uh -huh. We found that you don't have to have everything. You don't have to have money to be happy. And that with the graphs, it shows that actually, you know, the people who are less developed mm -hmm. are as happy as the people who are developed. And so happiness has nothing to do with money, nothing That's to do true, with yeah. possession, nothing to do with acquisition. But uh, easy to measure, though. Oh, this, this, uh, this, uh, oh, there are dimensions. Satisfaction is another yeah, thing. Dimensions yeah. to measure that, and, uh -huh. you know, like cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. to do that. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that the real purpose of architecture, and that's the amazing part of architecture, is to make people happy and to give pleasure to them. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you're designing a house for somebody, mm -hmm. all right? You can make it a super green house. It can be the greenest building in the world. But if it's not nicely designed, it doesn't make people happy, then it's just a useless piece of structure. That's true. And so no need to have to make it green, no need has it got to be functional, no need got to meet criteria of cost and time and authority requirements and be super green. Uh -huh, that's true. It yes. must make people happy. And if you're able to design a building or a place or a house, and the users who use it are immensely happy and, and find the building pleasurable then we fulfill our, our purpose in life, which is, you know, to... to Satisfied in terms of aesthetics. And enhance the, 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 the quality of life of people around us. That's right. You know, that's what, you, that's what I see architecture, the purpose of architecture to be. But, but I think it's a very complicated issue that uh, not only the architects are responsible on one hand, but on the other, I mean, it cannot be only solved by the simple efforts of the architects, okay, because it's, it's a... Uh, huge system with gears uh, onto each other, and we are just a part of that equation. It's a uh, collective effort, yes. It's a collective effort, so yes, that's yes. why I said as the fifth issue, the culture. The, the society must accept it as a value and, yes. uh, and uh, support it uh, in a very uh, sincere, uh, sensitive yes. way, so that, I mean, everything will become easy. But, yes. I mean, it is, on the other hand, very contradictory, the, the mode of commodification and uh, the, the system that we are living in, so it won't be very easy. So these uh, small examples or significant buildings, though they are not, uh, in mathematical sense, numerical sense, are not important, but as signs and symbols, 
uh, they are very important in that uh, uh, in that sense of uh, transforming the culture, maybe. Oh, well, could be, uh, but uh, any day you want to transform culture, you have to start with education. Education, that's true. Education. Yeah. You have to start at the, at the primary school level or the nursery level, so that children are taught about ecology. Now, if, if you're a teacher in a school of architecture, let me ask you, is ecology the curriculum of your school? Uh, in some of the uh, courses, yes. uh, part of those courses, yeah. uh, and there are some elective courses yeah. uh, as well. Uh, it has to be mandatory. Yeah, has, has because be once mandatory. you come into colleges and you study mm -hmm. ecology, your perception of the world changes. Then you start to realize that you're not the only species in nature. Uh -huh. There are thousands of species in nature who have every right to exist as you and I have. Mm -hmm. you know? Why must we destroy them? I must go on a piece of land and scrape the land and, and, and kill all the species. So, as you said, there are many ways to plan a city, many ways to plan, plan an environment. And the technique of ecological land use planning was developed you know, in the late 60s, where when you go on a piece of land, you have to understand the ecology of location. Mm -hmm. Then you have to find out where I can put buildings, where, 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 where I put buildings could have affect and endanger some species, affect the soil, affect the ecology of the location, affect the microclimate location. And so in this way, you can map locations where you can put your buildings, put your roads, you know, and go up, uh, put in your structures and the different types of land use. And so actually, you're right. That's true. Uh, ecological architecture starts with planning. That's true, yes. That, that's what I'm trying to understand. In somewhere, you said that in 1970s, the, the efforts towards creating a solar architecture or, uh, let's say, a clean energy uh, architecture is failed uh, because uh, they, they look like uh, built plumbing, you said. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Vincent Scully says, you know, ah, the architecture critic. Uh, he, said, yeah. he said that architectural, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the late 50s, you know, there was a huge interest in solar architecture. But because the solar architecture focused on just the engineering, mm -hmm. and then it, you know, then it looked like plumbing. Right. And so this is what Vincent Scully says. He says that's the failure of solar architecture. What he's trying to say is this. If you want to do an ecological architecture, it must be beautiful. It must be beautiful so that people can accept it. Because the lay people will not accept something that's ugly. Do you find Pompidou Center beautiful, for example? It's, it's a chunk of machinery. Huh? Junk of machinery. Yeah. Uh, many, many of the architects, for example, appreciate it as a, as a kind of a ideological idea uh, about, I mean, how uh, things are brought together. So, I mean, once you uh, get into an ideology like this, it is, it is opening a ground where other things can also flourish. It's, it's a very dated building. Yeah, I know that. I mean, but and, and that just showing where you put the plumbing on the outside. You know, it is really sort of, what it means is this, once you put the uh, air conditioning ducting outside, you've got to insulate it. Uh -huh. That's another waste of material, because why can't you put it inside the ceiling? You want to put the plumbing there again, you have to hide it, you do all sorts of things. And so to me, Maybe, it's, maybe it's, just start with, I mean, do we really need an air, air conditioning system? Different climate, yes. Huh. Let's, say, let's say if you're in a temperate climate, like in Paris, mm -hmm. you have two extreme seasons. You have very hot summer, or well, like in Istanbul, you have a hot summer, mm -hmm. extreme hot summer, uh, which superheats mm -hmm. for about maybe one or two weeks, and then you have a very cold winter, which gets super cold. Mm -hmm. But you have two very nice mid seasons, spring and autumn. Yeah, and so, what you want to do in a temperate climate and cold climate is to make use of the mid seasons. And mid seasons, you don't really need to heat, you don't need to uh, uh, air condition, yeah. and you want to extend the mid season as possible. And the way to do it is through natural ventilation. And you have to use biochromatic uh, design to extend the if mid seasons from, let's say, this month to this month. By true natural ventilation, we can expand it a little bit into the winter and into the summer. Mm -hmm. So, in this way, we reduce the need for heating in winter and need for heating in summer. And, and so, these are some things. Shorten the time span. That's right, yes, yes, that's exactly. Right. Yes, that's but. true. You have an uh, actually housing project in Turkey, as far as I know. Isn't it so? I mean, at least it is. It is yeah. Uh, quoted with your name, well, tulip, tulip or something. Well, like. they make use of my name because we did the initial design. They took the design, they changed it, they built it. Uh -huh. Nothing to do with me anymore. I see. Okay. So, yeah. so you, you didn't have a chance to 
follow the project and yeah. see the result and yeah. uh, couldn't measure the energy efficiency or Some something. Some countries like. do that. You know. Yeah, that, that. The I, other I, day I was in Beijing and, and somebody's driving me around and says, that's from building projects by you? I said, you know, it's not me. It's <laughs> just, you know, I did the original concept. Uh -huh. I didn't get it implemented. They took my concept, they designed something else, they implemented it, and say, this is the Kenyan project. Uh, that's so, so that's the... Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's some of the issues I have to live with. Yeah, yeah I see. but it's, yeah. it's good to underline this here mm. in this yeah, uh, yeah. interview to, to know everybody. Uh, I would like to come to the issue of uh, high rise versus ecology or something like that. Because, I mean, yeah. you, you came front at the beginning yes. with, uh, with, with changing the radical idea that it's not easy to uh, integrate yes. ecological uh, understanding of yeah. design with uh, high-rise or I mean mass mass house mm -hmm. housing uh, buildings. So I mean I think it, it was a kind of a uh, interesting uh, point. Let me explain. Most cities grow, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not, it grows. Um, of course, there are some cities which are shrinking, but there is a very small number of cities, and especially with the issues of immigration now into Europe, you know, by people from mm -hmm. developed countries, you have to accommodate increased population. Now, there are three ways to increase to handle the accommodation, increase increase the population. Mm -hmm. You can either push the city boundaries out, outwards. Mm -hmm. That means you, 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 the city eats into the countryside and eats into the agricultural. Uh, 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 agricultural land. And footprint becomes footprint larger. Becomes larger. That's, that's the first option. Mm -hmm. Second is that you keep the city boundaries and you build satellite cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you enlarge it and you enlarge boundaries, then as you said, you increase the footprint, you reduce the, 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 you reduce the arable land, the land you can grow food, and you eat into the landscape. So that's not desirable. A lot of city fathers find that to build once you build satellite cities, then the satellite cities have to be connected to the metropolis, to the, to, the, to the central city, and that means you've got to have a mass transit system, and mm -hmm. that's a high-energy solution. So what a lot of city fathers found is that keep the boundaries and optimize the land use within that city. Mm -hmm. Now you find that a lot of, in the city, there are a lot of brownfield sites, there, there are sites which are contaminated, We are trying to rehabilitate those, uh, those sites. There are sites which are under, densification, they're not dense enough, you can, in, in, you can densify them. And that what we try to try and do is that we should try and build towers over transportation hubs. Mm -hmm. Once you build transportation hubs, you reduce the need for the use of the private cars. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, a lot of city fathers, like London, like Milan, like uh, other European countries, the fifth, fifth uh, they intensified the land use within existing city boundaries. The fifth model is the uh, model the, in Turkey. I mean, yes. you do all of them together, so the <laughs> city high rise and <laughs> yeah. enlarge the pro footprint. You you see, I mean, you can see the difference uh, yeah, okay. in Istanbul as you come and go. You, you have a composite system. system, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's true. Well, that's life. Uh, but 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 still, uh, what you are mentioning is. Uh, quite related with the planning, of course, rather than architecture itself. But what you bring, uh, that planning is an architectural option, maybe, as, as utilizing the high-rise uh, building as a kind of a, a problem-solving medium or something like that. <clears throat> and um, in that sense, uh, I don't know, but uh, th there are alternative uh, understandings of ecological architecture uh, ideologically resisting to this density and the city life, etc. Because, I mean, it is integrated with all these issues that we have talked earlier, like, I mean, uh, making agriculture, recycling the mm -hmm. material, uh, decreasing the commodification as, as much as possible. Yeah. Or so, that, so, so it's kind of calling a sense of rural life, isn't it so? Well, there are a multitude of solutions. There's no one solution that everybody has to follow. That's right. You know, it's what I call a situationalist mm -hmm. uh, approach, where different situations, we have different strategies. And you, you know, it's very difficult to talk about generalization. If you have specific sites, specific projects, specific issues, specific city, then we should try and address it in that particular way. 
But when you're talking generalization, it is, you know, uh, yeah, that, difficult. That's, yeah. That is not easy to... Yeah. Uh, what, how do you see the current uh, picture in architecture? I mean, the contemporary architectural scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, with reference to this issue of ecology and without considering this uh, yeah. as, a, as a main, uh, let's say, consideration when mm -hmm. you look at the cities. For example, what do you think about Istanbul as you come and go? Mm -hmm. The contemporary well, architecture, especially. An architecture is good as any, better than most. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the very, very good um, Turkish architects. But back to this thing about. Do you, do you know any of them, namely? Um, well, you know, one of my friends, Suha Oskan, as you know, mm -hmm. is a very good architect, but he doesn't practice anymore. He's, he is. teaches and he does all sorts of things. And. Um, I'm not very good at, at Turkish names. Yeah, but, but, but you, you know at least yeah, I mean, yeah, some, some yeah. of these, you are familiar with. Yeah. Okay. But what I was going to say was that um, architecture has to do with much more than just doing buildings. You know, when, and to me, we have to start, as I said, at the infrastructure level, and, that, and we have to start with doing green eco-master plans. Mm -hmm. And that when we do a green building, it's not just doing a green building for sake of building because a lot of owners want us to do green buildings because it's good for the business. It you know makes make the corporate image look good mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know they've done green buildings. It sells. And after after you've done a green building, they say, right, I've done my bit for the world, and then they go back to their industries. What the architect should be doing is to try and persuade the owners to make their business green, to make the industry their own industries green. So in this way, we, we are extending our effectiveness beyond designing a single isolated building you know to 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 the um, to the to the industrial world and to the business world one of the things that uh, you know I don't have I didn't bring my slides to show when we did Kuchu the uh, this the competition site is always you know only this big mm -hmm. but we look at the whole region uh -huh. what we found is that you know on that part of Turkey part that part of Istanbul human beings have eaten into the landscape you have through deforestation, through agriculture, through urbanization, and that only part of the uh, landscape that's green is just a very thin strip at the top. And so what we try to do with Kuchuchak Meche is to relink nature, to make nature whole again, because human beings fragment nature. Whenever we go piece of land, we chop it up, you know, you know by mm -hmm. roads, by drains, by, by fencing, by impervious services. So we try to reconnect the green areas. That was our scheme for Kuchuk Chak Mache. But the only way to make it green, to make it continuous, is to use what we call eco-bridges. Mm -hmm. That means, let's say you have two patches of green linked by highway, <coughs> or separate by a highway in between. What happens, you bridge across the, two, the, you know, the highway mm -hmm. and you're vegetated. Then suddenly, which was two separate pieces of disparate green land, suddenly mm -hmm. becomes a single large ecosystem. Around Kuchuk Chak Mache. Yeah, that's what we did. We had a whole series of network of eco-bridges. And by doing this, you know, the, the, the rationale to make it commercially viable is that we've given Istanbul the single largest park you could ever have. And so in this way, we create a network of green areas around Istanbul, you know, for that part of, 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 of the country. And so, you know, these are just ideas that we're doing all the time. You know, we have, for instance, we just did a master plan for an island called the Reunion Island, which is the little island east of Madagascar. Yeah. And, and, uh, and what we try to do is to relink the landscape from the hills down to the, to the, to the vegetation in, in, along the waterfront. And, and to make, you know, because human beings, when they go on the island, they start to colonize the waterfront, put up buildings, put up urbanization, put up, put up, you know, develop areas there. But we try and create ecological fingers, ecological corridors, so the two are linked together like this. So in this way, we try. So this is, this is to me, the responsibility uh, of ecological architects is to repair nature. Now, studies have shown that the damage that human beings have done to the environment in the past, even if we stop everything we do now that will affect the environment, whatever we've done in the past will continue into the present, into the future. That's true, yes. And so, you know, for me, ecological architecture is not just for the present, but it also try and repair what we've done in the past and to make sure that whatever we do does not affect the future yeah, generations. Yeah. Decrease, so, the, decrease the impact for the future. Yeah, so there's the past, <coughs> restore the past, enhance the present, and, and avoid any damage in the future. 
And that is, that's what makes ecological architecture very, you know, very complex and, and difficult. So you are uh, working with lots of experts, I think, all together as well as planners and yes. ecological experts. And engineers. Other engineers, yes. Yeah, academics. Academics. Uh, because my, a lot of academics do my simulations for me. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, the, the effects of shadow on surrounding area, you know, I have academics who study the e ecology of the land for me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, a lot of professionals won't do it. So, so we have to, you know, we have to get engineers who are, who are prepared to work with us to quantify some of the things that we do so that, you know, it, it, it's a collective effort. Not one single person can do it. I can't do everything in my office. We have to make use of, you know, people here and there to help us. And something the worst, the client won't pay for it. So it has to come out of our fees or get That's my right. clients or get my, my, my academic friends to do it for a, for a joke in the beer. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very different life being an ecological architect. Yeah, whenever you, you, you start to uh, bring academia and practice together, that's, that's always the problem. I mean, nobody wants to pay for the academic research part of the uh, project, but it's inevitable, uh, I believe. What is the organization of the office? You have a head office in Malaysia, as far as I know. I have Malaysia, I have an office here. Mm -hmm. uh, in there, we have employed about 80 people. We have an office in London, about 20 plus people. And we have five offices in China, with about 300 people. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, it's, that's so much. So most of the projects are in China now, is it? Is no, it no, so no, no. Most of the projects are in Malaysia, Malaysia and elsewhere. You know, um, what we try to do is this: is that we cannot do everything in the scope of work ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we, we do the design, we do the design development, and then we do what we call design intent drawings, which are generic construction details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have for every country we work in. We have a local architect to work with us. You are subcontracting or uh, working together. Collaborating. collaborating. They'll take my uh, design time drawings, convert that into detailed drawings. But in the process, because ecology architecture is not just doing drawings, but you have to check the systems, check how everything works. And so we have to be involved at every stage of process uh, in from, 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 from the time we design to the time it's completed to make sure that everything is, you know, is complies with what we set out to do in the first instance. I see. This issue of ecology, environmental sensitivity, has always been a kind of a, uh, let's say, a Western philosophy or issue uh, that has been flourished in the developed countries because of the I mean, problems that has been created by the technology or something else. I mean, but one of the leading architects in this field, you are coming from the Eastern culture and Eastern societies. How, how do you explain this uh, conflict or, I mean, this uh, coincidence, let's say? Well, this is what I ask myself all the time, you mm -hmm. know. Am I East or West or somewhere in between? I was born in Malaysia. But when I was 12 years old, I left Malaysia to go to study UK. Yeah, I know. And so, you know, I, I have as much Malaysian as I'm British, uh -huh. you know, so it is, I have what you call, a, you know, my first passport is a British passport. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm neither East nor West, but somewhere in between. But it's also very important to understand both parts at a time, I think, both cultures at a time. It's, it's a kind of a richness, isn't it? So, I don't know. How do you see it? Oh, I don't know. How uh, <laughs> do I look at myself? I think it's important to, uh, the most important aspect actually is not the riches in the culture. The most interesting aspect is the sense of humor. Sense of humor, yeah. The Asians have one particular sense of humor, the English have another sense of humor, the French and the Americans have a different sense of humor. So and once we understand the sense of humor, then the relationships become very, very, uh, you know, yeah, very effective. I think that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kian Yang, uh, thank you very much for being with us. I mean, it was a very pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Would you like to add anything else that I forgot to say or you want to underline? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier on, um, one of the biggest issues today for me is that the present generation of architects mm -hmm. who are already in practice have no background in ecology. Mm -hmm. And so to try and persuade them to tell them to do something else is extremely difficult. And this is a whole generation of architects which are in practice today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will be the next generation of architects who will become ecological architects. 
but the present generation are very arrogant. You know, they say that you know they don't understand what I'm talking about, and that is the that is the biggest issue you have to confront. I've been doing ecological architecture for 40 years now, since 1971. And but things are changing. I mean, it, for 30 years it was extremely difficult because you know people didn't really understand what I was, what I was talking about, and that only about maybe about 10, 15 years ago. People, engineers started to give support to me in ecological design, in the, on the engineering aspects. Then I found the ecologists and landscape architects start to understand what I'm doing, and there are about a dozen or, or even several dozen of landscape architects in the world who, who, who will work with me and help me with, uh, with the ecology and the landscape aspects of it. And so in, in many, and there are planners as well who work with us. So in, in many ways, um, right now, I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> you know, I'm, I have clients coming to me because they seriously want to have a green master plan, seriously want to have green buildings, and I do my best for them. And so, but in my life, I realized there's a whole agenda of green aspects, theoretical design interpretation, the technological aspects of it, and the application and the construction, Academic, yeah. which, can, which I can never address in my whole lifetime. So I try and do as much as I can if I start pushing daisies. <laughs> pushing daisies and stuff. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, I like to end by quoting my favorite cartoon, a uh, favorite uh, puppet. You must have heard of Sesame Street. Yeah, I know that. Yes, Sesame okay. Street, that's a frog called Kermit. Yeah. It's it, green. It's our generation. It's maybe, our generation. maybe younger uh, yeah. wouldn't uh, remember it. Or, yeah. uh, do you know the song that Kermit sings? It's not easy being green. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, it's, it's a different reference, but it's, it's adaptable, I think. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much thank for you, being with us. Thank you. <laughs>